Hi everyone, I'm Jack the Rambling Raconteur. I hope that you're doing well. I'd like to share a few thoughts on The Assistant by Bernard Malamud. This is his National Book Award winning novel from 1957. And I think there are two features in this book that really highlight Malamud's strengths as a novelist specifically. Uh, in addition to being the absolutely brilliant short story writer that he was. And so those two features are his ear for dialogue, this authentic granular dialogue that he creates for his characters, and the deep ethical concerns that he really wants to develop and explore. This isn't a novel where the events just unfold and the plot takes place but there's this this reckoning of crime and punishment that the characters must uh, develop and, and explore and, and make choices around and so the, that's a real fascinating aspect uh, and feature of this book and it, it deserves the length of a novel not just a short story to achieve that effect um, and then at the end I'd like to talk about the significance of the ending because I think there's some really interesting um, avenues that Malamud takes us on as readers uh, at the ending but I'll warn for spoilers at that point now a brief summary the assistant is a titular character Frank Alpine and he commits a crime in nearly the the very beginning of the book he helps rob a small Brooklyn grocer uh, Morris Bober and, and Bober is getting up in years he's not really able to carry the milk containers in anymore uh, he, he's barely eking out just above subsistence living his old, uh, adult daughter Helen still lives with he and his wife Ida uh, but Helen has to turn over most of her salary just to help the family have food on the table uh, the irony, of course, is, is one of several that um, Malamud is developing, but there's an irony right from the beginning of a grocer who can barely afford to put food on the table for his family. Um, and so we see just, just how miserable and, and desperate their life is before this crime is committed. And the novel uh, switches between perspectives. We get uh, Morris Bober's perspective at the beginning. We get his daughter Helen's perspective. We get Frank's perspective as he's arrived. And we know before the other characters that he's the criminal uh, and, and we, we start to notice different features of Frank's uh, psychology that reveal that he is he's a, obsessed with this sense of redemption can he uh, find a way to to make good and 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 restore what he has taken from this family and so having committed the crime he then returns and and in a sense offers to begin helping to help out at the store and learn how to become a grocer and not really collect much pay and be the one who lifts the milk cartons, washes the windows, takes care of things, maybe tries to bring in some more customers to this failing store. And so that's going on, but, but there's this way in which Frank is trying to uh, provide the punishment to himself, that somehow if he can punish himself enough, deny enough to himself, he'll somehow uh, restore and find the redemption for this crime that he helped commit. And so that's the theme that Malamud is exploring. So, so I wanted to read a passage that shows how that sense of ethic is developed within the book. This is at a point where Frank is, is working at the store and he's thinking about what he should do. That was how he argued with himself, but it didn't help for long. He was soon again fighting out how to jump free of what he had done. He would someday confess it all. He promised himself. If, more, if Morris accept, accepted his explanation and solemn apology, it would clear the rocks out of the road for the next move. As for his present stealing from the cash register, he had decided that once he had told the grocer all there was to say about the holdup, he would at the same time start paying back into the drawer, out of his little salary and the few bucks he had put away in the bank, what he had taken, and that would fix that. It wouldn't necessarily mean that Helen Bober would then and there fall for him. The opposite could happen. But if she did, he wouldn't feel bad about it. He knew by heart what he would say to the grocer once he had got to say it. One day, while they were talking in the back, he would begin, as he want, had once done, about how his life was mostly made up of lost chances, some so promising he could still not stand to remember them. Well, after certain bad breaks through various causes, mostly his own mistakes, he was piled high with regrets. After many such failures, though he had tried every which way to free himself from them, usually he failed. So after a time, he gave up and let himself be a bum. He lived in gutters, cellars if he was lucky, slept in lots, ate what the dogs wouldn't or couldn't, and what he scrounged out of garbage cans. He wore what he found, slept where he flopped, and guzzled anything. By rights, this should have killed him, but he lived on, bearded, smelly, dragging himself through the seasons without a hope to go by. How many months had he existed this way, he would never know. Nobody kept the score of it. But one day, while he lay in some hole he had crawled into, he had this terrific idea that he was really an important guy and was torn out of his reverie with the thought that he was living this kind of life only because he hadn't known he was meant for something a whole lot better, to do something big, different, he had not till that minute understood this. In the past, he usually thought of himself as an average guy, but there in the cellar, it came to him he was wrong. That was why his luck had so often curdled, because he had the wrong idea of what he really was, and had spent all his energy trying to do the wrong things. 
Then when he'd asked himself what he should be doing, he had another powerful idea, that he was meant for crime. And he goes on thinking about the, this concept of crime, and then he remembers, but on the night of the holdup, he found himself nervous. In the car, Ward sensed it and cursed him. Frank felt he had to stick it out, but the minute they were both in the grocery and tying handkerchiefs around their mouths, the whole idea seemed senseless. He could feel it poop out in his mind. His plans of crime lay down and died. He could barely breathe in his unhappiness. He wanted to rush out in the streets and be swallowed up out of existence, but he couldn't let Ward stay there alone. In the back, nauseated by the sight of the Jew's bloodied head, he realized he had made the worst mistake yet, the hardest to wipe out, and that ended his short life of violent crime. Another pipe dream, and he was trapped tighter in the tangle of his failures. All this he thought he would someday tell Morris. He knew the Jew well enough to feel sure of his mercy. Yet there were times when he imagined himself instead telling it all to Helen. He wanted to do something that would open her eyes to his true self. But who could be a hero in a grocery store? Telling her would take guts, and guts was something. He continued to feel he deserved a better fate, and he would find it if he only once, once did the right thing. The thing to do at the right time. Maybe if they were ever together for any amount, decent amount of time, he would ask her to listen. At first she might be embarrassed, but when he started telling her about his life, he knew she would hear him to the end. After that, who knew? Uh, and, and so there, we see this character who's wrestling with this idea of redemption, but there are these subtle clues in there around uh, the, the, the fact that Frank is not this deeply philosophizing, existential, you know, heroic character. Right there in that passage, we see that he's not only here to enact this sense of redemption and, and give his service to the Bober family to repay them for the violence he had done, the cruelty he had done, frankly, the anti-Semitism he had, you know, he had been drowning in when he helped commit that robbery and, and the disdain he had for uh, not just a, a single Jewish grocer, but any Jewish individual who was other to him. But he's stealing from the cash register. He's still committing crime. He's sinking deeper and deeper into crime as he enacts this sense of self-punishment and this sense of redemption. Uh, and there are other, there's another crime he commits within the book uh, that is even worse than that, um, another act of violence. And so with that, there, there is this deep ethical concern Malamud is pushing at and probing at, and he's not giving a reader the easy answer. He's not allowing Frank as a character to simply you know, work his way back into good. Um, and there, there's something very interesting about that, that, that even despite all of Frank's sacrifices, we see the other side of it. We see the limitation of sacrifice when one is still committing evil. Uh, but let's talk about the dialogue because so many writers have this tendency to want characters to sound like the writer, to show off the writer's vocabulary and the writer's erudition and the writer's style and the ironies that the writer's capable of through the character's dialogue. But so few of us actually speak that way. So few of us have this enormous vocabulary and this ability to just say the right thing at the right time. And that's something that Malamud is very careful to do. Uh, his characters sound like someone who works in a grocery store, or someone who didn't have much education and has you know, been a hobo and lived a life of, of petty crime. His characters sound like someone we would meet in a bar or on the street or at a newsstand. Um, and, and that is a, this very realistic way of speaking, and he, and he does that in so many of his different books, and so I think it's a real feature that, that is a, a strength of his. Ida then entered the store by the inside door, and seeing the window being washed, hurried outside. You got rich all of a sudden? She asked Morris, her face inflamed. He does me a favor, the grocer replied. That's right, said Frank, bearing down on the squeegee. Come inside, it's cold. In the store, Ida asked, who is this boy? A poor boy, an Italian, or he looks for a job. He gives me a help in the morning with the case's milk. If you sold containers like I told you a thousand times, you wouldn't need help. Containers leak. I like bottles. Talk to the wind, Ida said. Frank came in, blowing his breath on water red and fist. How's it look now, folks? Though you can't really tell till I do the inside. Ida remarked under her breath, pay now for your favor. Fine, Morris said to Frank. He went to the register and rang up no sale. No thanks, Frank said, holding up his hand, for service is already rendered. Ida reddened. Another cup of coffee? Morris asked. Thanks, no, no, not as of now. Let me make you a sandwich? I just ate. Uh, he walked out, threw the dirty water into the gutter, returned the pail and brush, then came back to the grocery. He went behind the counter and into the rear, pausing to rap on the door jam. How do you like the clean window? He asked Ida. Clean is clean. She was cool. Uh, and so there, there's, there's no one who sounds particularly witty. No one who sounds as if they can say just the right thing at the right time. It, Ida perhaps has the, the deepest sense of wit, this sarcasm uh, inflamed by her anger and, and this sense of how could you hire help when we can barely put food on our own table? 
Uh, but but Morris and Frank, they don't have these vocabularies to show off anything. Uh, and, and Malamud is always willing to do that. In, in a book that's set on a college campus, he has characters who, who speak with a higher level of vocabulary, a different level of erudition. Uh, but here in his novels, the way where he's, he's back home, back in the streets of Brooklyn, his characters sound like someone he grew up with. And so the fact that he's willing to do that, the fact that as a novelist, he trusts his strengths as a writer uh, to allow his character to sound natural and to allow the, the, the ethical concerns to sort of sink, to, you know, push to the forefront rather than the, the wizardry of their vocabulary is I think uh, something that's very interesting and shows a different level of confidence, this trust in himself. Uh, the one character who in this novel who does seem to understand what to say at, at the right time more often than the others is Helen, who's had a little bit of a college education, who spends much of her time reading in the library or reading upstairs in her room. And so there's this sense of, of, of naturalism to the character who, who seems smartest, having the most you know, time for an education. And so uh, that's another feature of Malamud that isn't always clear in his stories, um, that the differences in, in, in diction that the characters have, uh, but it, it definitely comes through here. Uh, now, would I recommend this novel? In some ways, I, I think there are some real, real strengths to this book. I wanna talk about the significance of the ending um, in a minute, but the, it, it comes after The Natural, and The Natural is this incredible novel of sport and beauty. If you've only seen the uh, film with Robert Redford, I'd recommend reading the book. It, there are some key differences that reveal uh, the, the concerns Malamud was always focused on in his writing, that this sense of, of redemption, of hope, of what are the choices we make and do those ch choices follow us? Uh, do they condemn us per in perpetuity? Or is there a way that our, our, our choices can sort of reset and, and put us back to where we were before this fall that occurred. Uh, and that's something that The Natural is very obsessed with to a much greater degree, I think, than, than within the film adaptation. It's much less heroic and, and much more human. Uh, but his stories are also excellent. Some of his stories, The Cost of Living, I think it's seven years on, uh, were in a sense sort of dry runs for what he does in The Assistant. Um, but he has later stories like uh, The Jubert that really dig into some ideas around identity um, and Jewish identity. Uh, that, that are you know brilliant and, and fascinating and very dark um, because there's a darkness to this book as well so I'm spoilers now <laughs> jump to the recommended if you like if you want some some uh, recommendations for other works to think about but deep spoilers uh, at this point so there's a key idea in here around um, the Frank's identity as someone who is not Jewish and the other characters the Bober family the Karp family uh, who, who are Jewish and, and the way that they experience different things. And, and Frank as an outsider has this view of, oh, you know, the Jews have, have been made to suffer so much that that's why this, this man, this grocer is able to keep on going. Or that's why Helen has the life she has as someone who would like to go to college but can't afford to. Uh, and this idea that he, he's imputing all this suffering to a Jewish family as an outsider. Um, and in great contrast to, to other writers who had explored ways in which Jewish individuals were very much American individuals. I'm thinking specifically of Saul Bellow, uh, who in the same decade had written The Adventures of Aki March, which begins with, I am an American, <laughs> not I am a Jewish person or, or I am a Jew or I am a Jewish American, but I am an American. And here we, we and so with, with Bellow and with some other writers, there was this idea of um, making Jewish characters, Jewish American characters and American characters and um, not a sense of religious assimilation necessarily, but ways in which the uh, individuals could be part of, of, a, the, of the nation and feel that they were one more piece in the puzzle that made up the US. Uh, but here we have this almost reverse assimilation occurring here where Frank at the end not only is, is trying to enact this sense of redemption and spending time with the Jewish family and serving a Jewish family. But in the final sentences, he converts to Judaism um, in, in every way possible. And Malamud would later comment, well, he's not a very good Jew, but he does in a sense convert. Um, and so we have this, this reverse assimilation occurring here that I think is really interesting. Um, another, another feature is that uh, I think there's a way in which Frank represents this reenactment of aspects of the book of Genesis um, within the Hebrew Bible, within the Torah, uh, within the Christian Old Testament, and two specific aspects. One is the labors of Jacob in order to win Rachel, 
Laban's daughter. And the way that Laban tricks Jacob and, and, and so Jacob has to keep serving. There's a way in which Frank is, is in some sense enacting his labors of Jacob to try and, and, and earn some redemption, uh, having cheated and stolen and, and been a criminal in a sense, not unlike what Jacob had done, although much more violent, uh, but also in, in a way to earn uh, this, this man's daughter, Helen. Uh, it's just as Jacob had wanted to earn Rachel. And so there's that parallel, but I think there's also another parallel uh, a little bit later in Genesis when um, there is someone who's not Jewish who seeks to marry Jacob's daughter and he becomes enamored with her and so he, he rapes her. Uh, and that is something that occurs in here. There's a violent sexual assault that occurs in this book um, and it's not described graphically, but it's also something that the characters in a sense try to, uh, Helen tries to proce uh, process what has happened, uh, but I don't know if Mullenwood quite can can figure out how to write that that those passages, how to write that from her perspective, in a way that that honors her dignity and and her value as a human. Um, but uh, when that had happened, Shechem, who had who had raped um, Dinah, uh, the the uh, daughter of Jacob, then offered to convert to Judaism and, and um, had himself circumcised like Frank does at the end. And so I, th I and before Jacob's sons, uh, Simon and Levi came and murdered everyone in the town. Um, and, and so there are these little parallels uh, going on, I think, within the assistant that uh, do reach into the book of Genesis. So I'd be curious to know what others think. And now for the recommended, if you like, um, certainly I would say other works by Malamud, The Natural, uh, a number of his stories, The Magic Barrel. He has later books, I think The Fixer deals with anti-Semitism from a, a much more deeper historical perspective set um, in Russia, the Russian Empire. A New Life is a very different book where he's on a college campus and, and it's a little closer to a Roman eclep from his own experiences. Uh, but his later novels are, are very interesting as well. The Tenants is a very powerful book. Um, sort of the, the assistant except much more apocalyptic dealing with a Jewish character and uh, a black character in New York. Um, there are ways in which I think Rabbit Run by John Updike feels so close to what's happening in The Assistant in, in a number of different ways. The relations between men and women in particular. Certainly I had mentioned Crime and Punishment feels like something that Malamud was thinking about. He sort of explicitly references it uh, with the way that um, Helen has Frank trying to read some great literature and Dostoevsky's one of the ones she sends him to. I had mentioned Saul Bellow. I think um, in particular, the way that Bellow was, was sort of exploring his the aspects of his identity as a Jewish American and the way that Malamud was exploring it from a very different avenue, or, or that contrast is interesting. Uh, additionally, Richard Wright, I would say uh, the naturalism, the way that the dialogue feels so real, realistic, we're, we're standing there on the street with these characters, but also the idea of, um, of crime, of being wrong place, you know, at the wrong time, being the wrong person just there. Um, the Native Son, of course, goes in a very different direction, dealing with racism towards African Americans in Chicago, uh, but it, it, a brilliant book if you've never read it. I think Philip Roth is, is one of the two writers, along with uh, Cynthia Ozick, who were just absolutely influenced by Malam, who read all of his books, sort of just imbibed all of them and then explored the, the, their, uh, their past and their identity from a, their own perspectives like he had. Uh, Ozick with the, with the family pharmacy feels so close to what's happening here in The Assistant, but I would say Roth is just right there with him. Whether it's something like Goodbye Columbus, an earlier work, uh, whether it's Letting Go, where he's sort of, that, that, that feels so deep under the influence of Bellow, but also Malamud. Uh, whether it's the, the ethical questions um, within something like American Pastoral or The Human Stain, I think Roth was just a, a very deep reader of Malamud. Um, so some of the best features of Roth are the way in which he was a deep reader of writers like Malamud or Kafka or Bellow. As I had mentioned, I think there are real parallels to Genesis. The stories of Jacob by Thomas Mann uh, provide someone else's take on the book of Genesis. The desperation of Frank, um, the, the, the petty crimes he's involved in, and the, the more violent crimes he becomes involved in remind me of The Great Angels by Dennis Johnson. Fat City by Leonard Gardner feels very close to that. Uh, additionally, The Unbearable Lightness of Being by Kundera. Kundera has uh, concerns that are very different from Malamud's, but there's a way in which they parallel each other. And I don't know if Kundera had ever read Malamud, but I'd be curious to know. And then finally, the, the realism uh, and, and the, the naturalism that are, are a feature of Malamud 
are also a feature of Emil Zola's books. Um, I was thinking of so some of the more earthy books like The Earth, uh, not necessarily the pot boilers like Le Beige Humane. So let me know if you've read any Malamud, if you have a favorite work from him, and I hope everyone's doing well. Thank you.